Okay, everybody. So um, the Sync Up Conference, as you know, is put on by the Jazz and Heritage Foundation, but we have a very special partnership with not only the Grammy Museum, but also from right here in New Orleans, the Trombone Shorty Foundation, which, guess what, is the foundation started by none other than Troy Trombone Shorty Andrews. And they are huge partners of ours, and if, if, if it were not for them, we would not be able to do this event this evening. So everybody, please welcome the executive director of the Trombone Shorty Foundation, Bill Taylor. All right, thank you. Thanks so much to Scott Aegis and Jason and everybody here at Jazz and Heritage Foundation for, uh, for working with us. This is something we've been really looking forward to. Um, this came together in a really beautiful way. This is our first keynote interview. We're going to do a lot more of these, but this is, the, this is the inaugural one. And we're very lucky to have these two gentlemen join us tonight. Let me first introduce our interviewer. Warren Zanes, who started out as a young man in the band called the Del Fuegos, went to college here in New Orleans at Loyola, fell in love with the city, uh, has worked as the executive director of Stephen Van Zant's foundation, the Rock and Roll uh, Forever. Forever Foundation, the, uh, the VP of Education at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, and back in, I believe, 2003, wrote a book about Dusty Springfield's great record, Dusty in Memphis, which a gentleman by the name of Tom Petty read and loved and reached out to him and asked him to write his biography. So a couple of years ago, Warren Zanes wrote the definitive authorized Tom Petty biography. So please welcome in town from New York, from New Jersey, Warren Zanes. Thank you. And a special guest tonight, this is a true thrill for those of us who are uh, fans of American music. Um, uh, so glad, I know he doesn't do a lot of these, so this is a real special treat to have uh, him in town for this. We're so grateful that he's here. Uh, his story, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of it tonight, dates back to the, uh, to the 60s where he started at William Morris, met a gentleman there by the name of David Geffen, uh, very early on in her career, started managing Joni Mitchell. Then in 1967, became the manager of Neil Young, who to this day he continues to work with and manage. Um, over the years, the list of clients of his is just a who's who of American musical visionaries, from Tom Petty to Bob Dylan. Um, truly an impressive uh, roster of individuals that he's worked with, and I imagine that Anyway, it's a real honor to have him here tonight and in town from Los Angeles. Please welcome Elliot Roberts. Um, check, check. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Bill. Um, thank you, Elliot. This is, this is a, a fun opportunity for me. Um, I wanted to start uh, by asking you, uh, in the best case, what can a manager do for an artist? That's a tough one. What a manager. Um, it, do, I really, do I need this? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Okay, good. Okay, what a manager does is very hard to identify because every artist is unique and every artist is different and every artist gets handled a different way and has different needs. What I try to do is find out what the vision of the artist is and then fight for that vision. A manager's job is to protect the artist from everything around that artist, from the record companies, to the PR machine, to the radio, to the internet. It's my job to make sure that their vision is as much intact as it can be in a world of commerce. It's from getting the record deal to finding out where and when they should play and how they play. Okay, there's an analogy I always tell about what a manager does. An, an artist calls you and he tells you, there's a mountain in my way. I can't write, I can't record until this mountain is removed. 
You hang the phone up, and then you spend time removing that mountain. You call the artist back, and you say, I've removed the mountain. You're now free to creatively do what you want to do. The artist will hang the phone up. Ten minutes later, that artist will call back, and he will say, my friend just called me, and his tickets weren't together, and he didn't have his backstage pass. What the fuck do you people do? <laughs> and that's what a manager is. There's a high and a low every day. You win and you lose every day when you try to do things for your artist whether it's pitching them to somebody that could help them or making sure that their internet presence is... The world has changed so much now that part of a manager's job is to see that your artist can make a living because it's hard to make a living anymore when you're in a band or as a solo artist and you're just starting. With streaming and sales plummeting and streaming paying so little as it pays that it's very hard when you're a band in your 20s and your 30s to continue on as a band. You have to have the fortitude and the will to continue while you're facing adversity, which you will face. And it's a manager's job to take that adversity and make it something positive. It's very hard. I'll just finish this one thought. When I first started, we had vinyl. And vinyl was really a pure form of the music. You really heard all of the music. Every other avenue of entertainment has grown. From films, it's better quality. Television, it's 4D. The only means of entertainment that's tanked is music. We listen to MP3s or we listen to music on our computers and that really sucks. It's only 10% of what's on the master recording. So the actual product that we put out now is so inferior to the product that came before the internet. The consumer is taking, okay, to make a living now in this age of streaming, a manager has to be, and a band has to be. I don't pick people who I don't think are incredibly into it are in, and are smart and creative. It's not just about the music anymore. It's really about what you can do beyond the music to reach fans so they're aware of your music. Because there's just so much out there right now that for a new band to start, you have to have a site, you have to have friends shooting on your iPhone, your show, and putting it on your Facebook or Instagram, or you have to continually work. So you, I pick my artists very, very carefully. They have to have a great work, work ethic. They have to really give a shit about the music because they're the only ones who do. The record labels don't anymore. The record labels don't support artists the way they used to. They don't give you tour support. Uh, it's just totally up to you to be creative and to find ways to actually get your artist out there and have people pay attention to the music. Because there's so much out there, there's so much choice that I pick my people that I want to work with very carefully. They have to be smarter than I am. They have to be more creative than I am. Because if you want to really fulfill an artist's vision, you need an artist who's thinking, who's actually committed, whether he's winning or losing, to going on and to getting his music out there and recording. You really have to be so much more aggressive working with your artist than it used to be. It's not a matter of yelling at the agent or the labels not doing it or um, I, want, I want to go back to sure. when you did get to just yell at agents. Um, uh, but these, these guys need you to be more on the mic. Think Sammy Davis because they're recording this for future generations okay. who want to be um, successful. 
so thinking, you know, little Stephen always talked about the you know, second half of the 60s as the Renaissance period. Uh, but in that period, whether you're a producer, an engineer, a manager, or an artist making records, there were no blueprints for what was coming. How did you figure out what you just described in terms of good management? What were your models? And how did you come into this okay. as your profession? Part of being a manager, I knew shit when I started. I didn't know what a record deal was. Now you really have to. You have to. There's a book that I always recommend for my bands to read it by a guy named Don Passman. It's called The, the Business of Music. And it, it teaches you that when you work with an artist, the most important revenue stream he will ever have is publishing. So you always want to make sure that you safeguard your artist's publishing, that you never give your publishing in order to get a record deal or that you never give your publishing to anyone for money. Because ultimately, in the years that will go by, the, most, the biggest avenue uh, of money that you'll make in your 30s and 40s and 50s is going to be your publishing. So, so when, when you were doing the first Neil Young and Joni Mitchell deals with Mo Austin... I kept that uh, publishing. You kept all the publishing? All the publishing. Or, or I walked. And, w and what gave you the leverage to get that? I think he wants you leverage, closer on the mic. I had mic, artists. So. Talk into the mic. I had artists who understood that, and if I said we had to walk, they walked. That's part of the trust that you have with your manager is that he will make those decisions for you and with you. And a lot of times you'll have a strong opinion, and the artist will go, "No, I, I just don't buy that. That's not what I want to do." And then you kill for whatever it is that he does want to do. But there has to be a trust between the artist and the manager. I've never had a contract with any of my artists. I've managed a lot of people from Tracy Chapman, the Eagles, Tom, Bob, Neil, Joni, Fishbone. Uh, and I've never had a contract because I've always believed if it's working, it's working. If it's not working, it's not working. I don't want to get money from somebody. I don't want to have to sue a band because they didn't think that we were on the same page. And I've lost clients. I've dropped people who I just said, if you're not going to listen to me, there's no purpose in having this relationship. So it has to be a relationship that's real strong and that's really trusting. They have to trust you and you have to trust them that occasionally you'll be wrong and they'll be right. And I've been wrong a lot. I've been right a lot more but I've been wrong a lot. When did you have your epiphany that what you wanted to do was artist management? Uh, Joni. Um, Can you bring us into that moment? I was working on the William Morris mailroom, and I answered an ad for a management position with uh, Bob Chardoff and Erwin Winkler, who were Chardoff Winkler. They ended up going into the film business and doing all the Rocky films and all the Martin Scorsese films. Um, and in their office, they only managed comedians. It was Jackie Mason and Jackie Vernon and Stiller and Mara and the National Lampoon, the guys who started National Lampoon. They had one singer-songwriter, um, a Canadian Indian named Buffy St. Marie. And um, Buffy said to me, Buffy had just recorded a song of Joni's, and she said, Elliot, go to the Cafe A Go Go. Joni Mitchell's playing there. She's opening for Richie Havens, and you're going to love her. She's really nice. I went down that night, and I saw Joni, and she sang the first two albums she had. Her set consisted of the, what ended up being her first two albums. And I went over to her after the show and I said, I'm, I'm a manager. I don't manage anybody, but I, I'm a manager. And um, I'd love to manage you. And Joni was alone at the time. She would make her own travel arrangements and her own club dates. And it was just Joni and she carried a guitar. So she said, you know, I'm leaving tomorrow for Detroit. I'm starting a four week tour. If you want to come with me and pay your own expenses, you can carry my guitar. 
And I did. I met her at the airport the next day, and we went to Detroit, um, a club called the Canterbury House. And over the course of the next four, four weeks, we met her ex-husband, who had stolen her publishing, oddly enough, and I got it back for her. And at the end of the four weeks, she asked me to manage her. And um, I made a lot of mistakes. I had her audition for the Johnny Carson show, you know, which, huh? Um, again, I was an aggressive young manager, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know what publishing was and what a mechanical royalty was. I didn't know what a good record deal was. How do you protect the artist? How do you write into that contract creative control? so that you can actually make the kind of record you want to make. And you learn through error, unfortunately. The first record deal I made for Joni was seven points. That's seven cents on every dollar that came in. And out of that seven cents, we paid the producer two cents. Who's David Crosby. Who's David, yeah. So Joni netted a nickel on the first deal. I, I renegotiated the deal. I just don't want you to think I left it there. Um, but you learn. Again, an artist asks you, how much do I make on a record sold? What's a mechanical royalty? You mean I get my publishing gets 10 cents on every track of every record sold? Yeah, you do. So you have to learn that. You have to actually be prepared to defend your artist and the only way you can defend them against all these lawyers and the record company horde uh, is to know what you're doing. And you only can do that by, really, by experience and by studying, by knowing, reading, knowing what publishing is, knowing how to start your publishing company, knowing how to protect your copyrights. The artist's copyrights is the most important thing other than his wife and children that he'll ever have because they're forever. They're 52 years and then they're renewable. So that's a, uh, where when you're in your 50s and your 60s, after you've done this for 20 and 30 years, that's what you have. You have your publishing. Those early songs, early catalogs will pay you forever if you've done it correctly and you've protected your artist. So w when, when you went in to renegotiate the Joni Mitchell deal, at what point, how many records were out when you did that? Just the first two? No, I was very lucky in that the very first month that uh, after we were together a month, we went out to California to record. I had gone out and met with Mo Austin and played Mo a tape of Joni's. And uh, he had a young A&R guy there with him called Andy Wickham. And Andy loved the tape and convinced Mo to sign Joni. And we went out to record. And the very first night of recording, um, we were in Sunset Sound, the recording studio in LA, and the Buffalo Springfield were in the studio next door. And someone mentioned that to, to us when we were in the studio. And Joni says, I know Neil Young from Canada and you're gonna love him, he's so funny. And I was living on the floor of uh, B. Mitchell Reed's house, who was a DJ in LA, on a mattress on the floor. So we went next door to the Buffalo Springfield and Neil had just taken an apartment um, with three bedrooms. And so uh, the next night I moved in with Neil. He was like really gracious and we became good friends and pretty soon I was managing the Springfield and then when they broke up I managed Neil as a solo artist so and Crosby was the producer and Stephen Stills was in the Buffalo Springfield but, so Warner Brothers had originally tried to sign Stephen Stills yeah right no uh, he, he actually what happened was the Buffalo Springfield broke up and they were a Warner band they were signed to Atlantic so in order for me to get Neil out, we ended up trading Richie Fure into Poco and Stephen Stills to Atlantic. 
and kneel to Warner Brothers. So, so it's not unlike hockey. It took a lot of time to actually do that and free everybody and make those deals, but by the end of it, um, I was managing Joni and Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young. And this was all in a four month period, five month period. I was 23 and knew nothing I mean, maybe less than nothing, because so, I thought I knew something, which is the most dangerous part of it all. How do you, how do you feel you gained their trust? Because that's a, that's a You just quite have to really be transparent, and, um, and you only gain trust in time. Trust is not something that you do from Monday to Wednesday. Trust is something that, is, through adversity, is built. And when you start a band, there's adversity everywhere that you look. Um, and it has to be overcome. And if you're leading the charge of that overcoming, you gain trust. And again, trust is built up over a period of time by doing the work, by the band or the act feeling you are protecting them. You're not managing for your career so that you can <coughs> do something else, that this is what you do and that you'll be there for them all the time that they need someone there for them. So it's not something that you, you just get. It's something that you, again, have to build. Why do you think that the, the so you had Joni and Neil both on reprise uh, with Mo Austin. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think that was such a, a productive period for the artists, for the label? At that time, Warner Brothers was the only West Coast label. All the other labels were out of Columbia, RCA, MGM, all the other big record labels were out of New York. But the music that was happening that, at that point was happening in San Francisco and LA. So, um, you know, everyone was running to LA to get The Doors and Janis Joplin and The Dead and Moby Grape and all these great, Jan uh, great bands that were coming out of San Francisco and LA. So all the music that was happening, there was The Village with The Loving Spoonful and one or two other bands, but all the real uh, innovative bands of that era were coming out of the West Coast. And Moe was the only West Coast label. So he had Hendrix, he had Van when he was young, James Taylor, Joni, Neil, were all Warner artists. So um, I think the big advantage he had was he was there and it wasn't an A&R guy selling them any goods. You could actually go to Warner Brothers and meet with their graphic department and do your cover. And um, They were all right there and they, because they were right there, you really got the impression that they cared about the music. As you're beginning to manage these major careers, uh, you're mm -hmm. obviously learning a tremendous amount about the record business. Why did you not, like David Geffen or like Irving Azoff, who came out of your office, go into the record side of the business? Well, I did. We, uh, Asylum was David and my label. We equally shared that. And uh, Tom Waits and a bunch of other artists that uh, we wanted to sign. Jackson Brown was our first artist. Um, but I like managing people. So um, when David started Geffen, I signed Tom and the Cars and Devo and um, music that I liked and people that I wanted, that I thought were really smart um, and that I liked being with. At that point, and that's important, it's your life. You're giving up time with your family. You're giving up time with your kids in some cases. So you really want to be around people you like and that you care for, and that you feel the time that you're giving up is worthwhile. That way you don't really get animus involved. How do you deal with the conflict of interest? So like when you're, a, you and David are, are asylum together, and you're managing an artist on asylum. Okay, that happened with the Eagles. We were managing the Eagles, and they were our first band on asylum. Actually the second band, I think Jackson was the first band. At some point, we had to make decision to record them or to manage them. Irving worked for me as one of my managers. 
and um, he took care of the eagles for me. And so we decided the best course for us was to keep recording them and not manage them. And that's exactly what happened. You can't really manage somebody and record them on your own label, especially in the case of the Eagles. Their first album was a huge hit. As a manager, I wanted to renegotiate right away and get them a better deal. As the label, I didn't want them coming into my office. <laughs> so there is a duality there that you have to you know, either justify or make a decision. We were talking earlier about you know, how you viewed the longer career, you know, late 60s through the 70s, and the importance of that third record, which is a model that doesn't so much apply in, no, in, in our the, day. In the age. era of streaming, when we first started, you, you counted on three albums. You counted on the first album introduced the act to the band, and you opened in clubs, and you tried to tour it. Uh, by the second album, you hoped that you were headlining in clubs or that you were an opening act in theaters, um, playing 1,000 seaters and 2,000 seaters. By the third, third album, you would either be headlining clubs yourself and able to tour, um, or you would be an opening act on a bigger act and you'd be making decent money. A hard part of managing a band is keeping them intact, is making a living. A band has to make a living. You know, when you're in your 20s, you don't, for the most part, you, you're, you don't have a family, you don't have a wife. Music's 24 seven. You're hanging with the band all night long. You're having a great time. You can't wait. You can play seven shows in a row, you know, because youth will allow you to do that. But um, when you get in your 30s or at 30, for the most part, you might be married or in a relationship. You might have kids. You start having the, not the worry, but from the manager's point of view, you want to make sure your act can earn a living, can support himself. I've, I've seen more bands break up because they just couldn't go on anymore uh, at the level they, you know, sometimes it takes four albums, five albums. Uh, we were talking about Cage the Elephant uh, before. I think they're on their eighth album. And there's, it, there's no, there's no way to really measure. You can measure where you are career-wise by what's happening with your offers. Uh, are you getting good offers? Can you tour nationally? Uh, you know, can you tour heavy locally? Are you playing colleges? Um, but still the end game is you've got to stay together. And, and in order to stay together, for the most part, you have to be able to sustain the band and, and the individuals. So. To, to, to that end, I mean, you, t you told me a really uh, important and interesting story about Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. When you uh, joined with Tony Dimitriotis to do the Heartbreakers, you made a, a move that was important for the band that potentially could have broken the band up. Okay, when uh, I saw Tom at the Whiskey A Go Go, and it was his first album, and I thought he was fucking amazing. And I wrote Tom a letter I, I didn't know him and I hadn't met him, but I wrote him a letter and um, his album wasn't doing well, that first album, it was sort of a stiff. And um, I had met Tony before in England. I was arrested at the Isle of Wight and Tony bailed me out of this prison in London. Oh, I don't know, it's a whole other story. So I knew Tony and Tony had been there and he was saying, oh, Tom's feeling real bad, his album's not doing real well. So I wrote him this letter um, telling him that I thought he was amazing and to stick with it, that he's gonna happen, he's gonna be as big as he wants to be. And, and, and I sent him the letter and I didn't hear from him for about two months. Uh, and then he called me and he said, um, can I come in and talk to you? And he came in and um, with Tony and um, I took him on as a client and I hired Tony. 
who is now one of the best managers. Uh, he's been with Tom forever. Had been with Tom forever, unfortunately, since Tom's passing. But um, so I started working with Tom and Tony. Tony was my tour manager, and Tom was the artist. Um, but but the thing. Okay. Then we had a. I'm just giving you a little background before <laughs> I get to that fateful meeting. I want to get to the gritty stuff. Okay. Let's. Um, then we did damn the damn the torpedoes which is a very, very successful album for Tom. And we were in the middle of a lawsuit when we did that album. So it was not for a record label. We were suing ABC. Uh, ABC had been bought by another conglomerate, and we felt that our contract was not transferable. And so I paid for the album myself, and we recorded it while we were in court. And every night, um, I would come to the studio and pick up the tapes and put them in my trunk. And I kept them at my house. And then I would bring them back the next morning. And Jimmy Iovine was producing that record. Um, and we won the lawsuit, ultimately. And we put out them the torpedoes on Shelter, which was Denny Cordell's label. Um, then we started to be successful, and all the onus on this was on Tom. Tom was writing, Tom was singing lead, Tom was playing guitar, Tom was doing all the press. And in, uh, in those days, everyone was equal. Everyone shared everything. No one got any more. They shared publishing, they shared live income. It came to me, it dawned on me, that this was not going to work for the future because Tom was getting very frustrated that he was doing everything and getting one-fifth of the share. So I called a meeting the next day with Tom and the Heartbreakers, and I had him come into the office. And I told everyone that we were changing the dynamic that from now on, Tom was getting 50%, and the other four guys would share the remaining 50%. And I did that because, as I told them, this will keep us together. Otherwise, this band will not stay together anymore because Tom just can't bear. And I didn't mention that Tom had mentioned it to me. I mean, I just, he, Tom was not there in the no, meeting. Uh, no, it was just the heartbreakers. Yeah. I had asked just the band to come in, and I told them this, because I didn't want Tom to have to be there. Uh, and I really believed, and though everyone was really pissed at me for a long time. Some of them still are. Had, no, they're not, actually. They're all, all good friends. Um, but I really felt that that was something as Tom's manager that I had to do. And I took the chance that maybe it would break up the band. Maybe some would say, hey, no, this is bullshit. Um, that didn't happen. Everyone sort of understood that for Tom to carry this load, he had to be compensated for it because he was giving up a lot of his life. He's doing interviews you know, on a daily basis, and no one else is there. It's just Tom. Um, you know, he's writing at night, he's recording, he's mixing, he's doing everything. And a lot of times, no one's in the studio but Tom. And he's working his ass off. So I felt it was something as his manager that I had to do. And I did it. And to this day, they're together. They were together until Tom's passing. And I really think that, uh, and I explained to them that as individuals, they were going to grow. You know, Mike Campbell was going to be a great producer and play guitar on a lot of records. Ben Montench is a great keyboard player and would work with a lot of people and produce people that if they were just patient, they each had their own future, and they did and do. But, but for a band, psychologically, you come from that all for one, one for all, us against the world mentality, and suddenly, it was like it happened with the band. Yeah, uh, that dynamic doesn't change. You know, the money part should not affect one for all and all for one. 
That didn't mean the money. It meant the project, the music. They all participate in the music. When they co-write, they get publishing. When you contribute, you get paid. But when one person is the only contributor, then he has to be compensated for that if you want to keep that together. Otherwise, he's going to get really pissed off in time and quit and do solo projects. And ultimately, those are the kinds of decisions. Keeping a band together is the most important part of what a manager does. Yeah, you want to elevate them each time and have them grow as musicians, without question. But that happens organically if they're together, if they can still hang, if they're not pissed at each other, if there's not envy in the room, if it's really clean and clear, then the music really just grows and it gets bigger and better and more important. Can, 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 I, can I ask you, because you gave a couple examples, whether it was jo Joni Mitchell asking to, you to carry a guitar or you hiding master tapes in your trunk. Is part of being a good manager staying flexible in terms of what the job is, al allowing it to reshape? I never thought that I would be making films or film deals or book deals or working with people on Broadway. Y you never think, uh, you know, these are opportunities that start arising when you're working and it's working good. Uh, as a manager, you get to do so many things that you had no idea you would be doing that you then have to learn. Neil did a book a few years ago um, for Random House, and I made the book deal. But I had to research what the hell is a book deal? <laughs> How do I protect all the rights that come from the book, the film rights, or whatever rights, residual rights there are? So you're constantly having to learn. You're constantly exploring other avenues on your artist's behalf. And it's just such an organically cool job. I never thought I would have a job where I just said, oh, I don't like that, or that's great. I didn't think that could be a job. I didn't know what a manager did. I didn't know what a manager was. I had met Albert Grossman with Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, when I was in college, I went to Bradley University for one year, and um, I was on the track team, and I worked in the gym, and Peter, Paul, and Mary were playing in the gym that night. They were doing a concert at school in the auditorium, and we were setting chairs up. And I noticed people kept walking over to this man who had these glasses and long, long hair, and they would talk to him, and he'd say something, and they'd leave. And it happened all night long. And finally, I asked somebody who he was, and they told me that's the manager of Peter, Paul, and Mary. And I went over to Albert, and I asked him, hi, and I, I was just this kid in school, and I asked him, hi, I'm Elliot Rabinowitz, which was my name then. And I said, what, what do you do? And uh, he said, well, I manage Peter, Paul, and Mary. And I said, well, what does a manager do? And he sat me down, and he talked to me for about two hours about what he did, about making the deal. And I, I never forgot Albert, who ultimately became a friend. Uh, and I never forgot how cool it was that he just was able to sit there, walk out, get high, come back, and it was his job. That was his job. I went, gee whiz. You know? What was at the heart of his philosophy of management when he talked to you at that time? You know, his basic philosophy was the same of mine. Follow the vision of the artist because that's who has the vision. If you're true to the artist's vision, you will get it right. If you start screwing around with it because you think you're smarter than your artist, which is never the case, you'll fuck it up. So you really have to find out what is that artist's vision? Is it be a star? Is it he just loves to make music and he doesn't give a shit where or when? He just wants to play? And I've tried to work with people of the latter, people who 
music is the, I've been very lucky that my muses were Neil and Joni, and that's who I started with. I made a lot of mistakes. I fucked up a lot of things, because I was very young when I started with them. Um, but, uh, but I learned that the creative process doesn't come from me, it comes from the artist. And you have to recognize what it is that they really want. What do they really want to do? Everyone has a different goal on why they get into music and how important music is. Okay, in my mind, music has been so devalued in the age of the internet that it really sometimes makes me sick. What we listen to now uh, all other avenues of entertainment have grown. Films are, you know, amazing now. And the, the way they can have these superheroes and the, the techniques. TV is 4K and 4D and, you know, it's amazing. Music is an MP3, which sucks. The MP3 is 10% of what's on a master recording. Literally, 10% of what's on the master recording, and that's our norm. And now music seems to be regulated to, you know, something you do while you're on your computer in the background, or um, it, it's sort of watching what's happened to music and what we sell now, the actual product, is so inferior to what we used to sell as a product, just physically as a product. The labels have so fucked this up. And the main reason is, uh, can I just do this? It'll take a second. When streaming started, and when Napster started, and pirates started, they all started at the same time, the beginning of the internet. And none of the people at the record labels were internet savvy. They're music people. They were about the music. They didn't understand what the internet was and the power of the internet, that a guy in Sweden could start a service that had every song you own on it out of Sweden and you could put it on your computer and actually access it. And that's what started to happen. So the labels, when Spotify and other streaming services started, the alternative was either make a deal with us for shit money or let the pirates steal all your music and you'll get nothing. And the labels fell for that. And so they made these horrible, horrible streaming deals that pay the artists on a million downloads, on a million hits, $12. Now, there aren't many artists that get a million hits, but for a new band now, in my era when I first started, and I like to think this is still my era, but you could make a living on selling CDs and vinyl. CDs didn't have cassettes or vinyl. You made a living. It, it actually paid you money. You had mechanicals and you were actually selling product. Now with CDs tanking and the streaming as the majority of how people listen to your music, it's that much harder for new bands to get started because their income stream has been cut so sharply and so drastically that it's hard to get to that third album. It's hard to, in your 30s, if you, God forbid, get married and have a kid, it's hard to stay in the band. It's hard to support it because the income streams you're making now in streaming is so small and um, that it's very hard. So. Streaming's done two things. It's devalued the sound we listen to, and it's taken away our money. And we let it happen. It just happened. And it's happening as we sit here and speak, that our music's devalued. We listen to MP3s on our iPhones like it's great, it sucks. Again, it's 10% of the real music. Do, do, but do you think that, and, and I'm not looking for a silver lining, but it obviously puts an emphasis on what can happen at the level of live performance. Do you think that will uh, force people to think a little bit more about what they're doing out on the road, what they're doing in terms of putting on a show? Everybody says, well, they're, the bands are making their money on merch. No, they're not making their money on merch. 
Only the big successful bands are selling merch. The guys in the clubs that are opening in the clubs and that are headlining in the clubs, they're not making a living off their merch. They're lucky if it pays for the bus and for dinner that night. You but, know. but I just mean on the level of people, you know, in order to, to rise to the top, to be seen. Okay, to rise to the top now, you have to be so much more creative. You have to be everywhere. You have to be on Facebook, on Instagram. You have to have people shoot your shows, your friends, on their iPhones. You have to post it. You have to get Facebook Live and get on the bus after you play a show and talk about the show. You can do that now. That iPhone that you have is a creative tool. It, first, it sucked the life out of our music, but now that it's entrenched in our lives, you have to look at it as a positive. Now you can film your show. You can, you can go on. Um, there's apps now that allow you to go live from your bus or your car as you go to the next show and talk about the show. I told you about this, two girls who recorded for me named Tegan and Sarah. I don't know if you know them, but they're two of the smartest, most creative people on the planet. And we had a lot of trouble with their record, getting people to pay attention to their music. And they started doing these shows after their shows. They would carve trees out of cardboard and it would be Florida. And they would interview each other and other bandmates and they were funny and charming. And they started doing these podcasts every night after their shows. And pretty soon we could see their fan base was building. People were coming and telling their friends about how funny these two girls are and how smart they are and cool. And they built that up to, by the second album, um, we were able to do over 300,000 records because they worked at it 24-7. They never stopped trying to promote themselves in a smart, creative way, not in a tacky way. And that's something you have to do now. As a new act, you have to try to be everywhere because there's so much out there. You know, everyone with a a computer has a, something on SoundCloud or on Bandcamp. There's thousands and thousands of bands out there. How do you get them to pay attention to your band? Well, the only real way is to be smart, to be creative, to offer something that's unique and different, to show why your band is different and more unique than another band. And you have the tools to do that now. We didn't have to have those tools in the early days because it, we could create it ourselves through playing. Um, and again, as you were saying, it was the beginning in the 60s, so people weren't going to clubs as much till like 63 and 64, but by 65, there were live bands everywhere and everyone was going to clubs and seeing bands and you could play. You know what's interesting about New Orleans as we walked around, my girlfriend Dana and I walked around for the last few days, and I've been here a few times because uh, we recorded with Daniel Lanois two Bob Dylan albums here. And so I spent a month in, in New Orleans. And in coming back last night, it reminded me how many great bands there are here, how much live music there is here. You, we must have seen seven or eight bands in the two nights that we were here of varying degrees. Some were good, some weren't. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of live music here. As a musician, you can work here. You can work in Memphis. You can work in Austin. There are certain towns that are so music-oriented that you can make a living. There's a lot of places to play. You can go from one bar to the other bar and, or one you know, small hall to another small, but you can get to play three, four, five nights a week, and that's such a luxury to be able to play that much because you, you get better by playing. That's the only way to get better is by playing. There's no other way. I, I, I want to I ask one question and then and open it up so that, that the audience can ask some. You were talking about you know, what, the, what the manager does is going to be determined in part by 
who that artist is. And you did get Dylan at an interesting point. In Chronicles, he describes you know, that lost period before he connected with Daniel Lenoir. Uh, but you've got, you know, when he comes into you, you manage him for a decade, he's already Bob Dylan with a capital BD. Uh, how was it different dealing with him than it was with Neil from the first record forward? Okay, uh, two things about Bob. He's one of the funniest people I've ever met. He has this amazing sense of humor, and he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And Bob is very transparent. There's no bullshitting with Bob. Um, at the time that he came to, to me, it was his Christian period was just coming to a close. And he was just looking for other avenues and other things to do and other ways to make his music. Um, so that's rare that you work with a Bob Dylan. And I was in awe every single day, every time I was with Bob, I would say, I can't fucking believe I'm with Bob Dylan. This is so <laughs> whack. And he wants to know what I think. This is fucking crazy. Uh, I, and, and I'm serious about that. There wasn't a day that I wasn't in awe of Bob, who's my personal favorite artist and probably biggest influence in my life has been Bob Dylan. Um, but he's so open. You know, he's a very smart man. He's very open. Neil is the same way. I've been very blessed. Um, Working, and again, I pick smart people. I do, I, I don't say that cavalierly. I try to work with people who are smarter than I am. Um, and they're out there. <laughs> okay. Um, um, so Bob knew where he was at. He, he asked me what I thought, what he, we should do. I, I picked Daniel. I had known Daniel, and I think Daniel would have been a, a great guy to make a record with Bob, and Bob agreed, and we made the records with Daniel. Um, and then later on, um, I thought I had an epiphany after getting high one night that it would be great if Bob toured with Tom, with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And I approached Bob with that, and I said, you know, I think this would be killer, and you'd really enjoy it. And he said, let's do it. And we did. And we did the same thing with the Grateful Dead. Jerry called and said, you know, actually that wasn't my idea, it was the Dead's idea. And Jerry called me up and he said, we'd love to tour with Bob. Any chance that we could back him up? And I said, well sure, I'll ask Bob. And Bob was way open to that. He knew the Dead had was uh, always played a lot of his material and uh, he loved what they did with it. And, and so we, we did that tour. So uh, again, when, if you're dealing with smart, creative people, listen to them, and they will lead you in the right direction. And you know, my experience with Neil is he's just smarter than I am. I'll have a lot of ideas, and then Bob will make, uh, Neil will make them better ideas. And when you work with true artists, they will fail, and they won't hold it against you. You know, you constantly see managers being fired because the album didn't do well, you know, and this one did, and then the next one didn't, and the manager must suck. No, it was probably the record sucked. That happens. There's never been an artist in history that's gone straight up, whether it's Michael Jackson or Miles Davis or Sinatra or Dylan or Beck, the trajectory doesn't always go up. There will be failure. And there are artists who can handle that failure and move forward. And Neil is that artist. Neil will do albums that he believes in regardless of whether it will sell or not sell. It never even comes into the equation with Neil. Uh, he does product from the heart, and as does Bob, as does Joni, as does any great artist, 
you really have to be willing to fail, to take a risk, to do a blues album once in a while, or to do a, something that you believe in that is just against your fan base's nature. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and think you're going to have a long career. You won't. You have to be willing to take risks, and there are very few artists who are willing to take risks and fail. And that failure is not anyone's fault. It's, that's how life is. It's like any relationship. You know, music is, is like life to me. You know, you win, you lose, it's good, it's bad. Um, and in the long career arc over the course of time, you have to be willing to fail and not look to people. That's just, you know, your fans, that one didn't get it for them. It's okay, move on. You don't make your music for your fans. You make your music for you. And if you're earnest in it and sincere in it, your fans will come along. If you are willing to take risks, they'll come along. If they see you don't mind losing once in a while, they'll come along. Because we all lose every once in a while. And it's part of the process. It's part of growth. It's part of music. You're not going to, again, there's no one ever in history that's just kept going up. It just doesn't happen. It's never happened before with anyone under any circumstances. So once you realize that, then you don't mind taking a risk. You don't mind you know, possibly failing. And you don't blame it on your manager. You have to, again, it's that bond of trust between a manager and an artist. Um, do, do, you th do you think the art of personal artist management along the lines of what you have done is alive and well today? Yeah, totally. There's some great managers out there that I know. John Silva is a great manager, is, is very, very good. Tony's very, very good. John Silva manages um, Beck. Foo Fighters. Um, and Foo Fighters and, um, <laughs> God, he has so many great artists. Um, there's good managers out there. You know, in, in, in the 60s, most of the managers owned a bar. And that's how they became managers. There was a band that played their bar that was good, and everyone, well, that band's going to happen. And that guy became their manager. Um, there weren't managers per se. There were, you know, Albert in New York and another guy who I love named Harold Solomon, who was a folk manager who managed Baez and Judy Collins and a bunch of the early girl folk singers. Um, there weren't promoters then w when we started. They, they didn't have anyone in Detroit or Chicago or Philadelphia. There was, Bill Graham really started that. Uh, Bill took San Francisco and um, promoted in all the venues in San Francisco and paid you and there were beverages and there was a <laughs> dressing room. You could pee. It wasn't a, uh, a, a... You really felt that he cared about... He was glad having you at his venue and you were going to get a square shake. He had good sound systems in all his venues. And that caught on. And then pretty soon you had a string of really good promoters that kept that same um, for the artist mentality. And there was the cellar door, Jack Boyle, and who had Washington and a little of the South, and Don Law in Boston, and Larry Maggot in Philadelphia, and Ron Delsner in New York. And they all took Bill's model let's, and let's, had upgraded music because... Yes, yeah, something that was not there got built and remained. I mean, I feel like looking at the, the moment we're in right now, we don't know where things are headed. The former model has crumbled in many ways. But could you say that on some level we might be at one of those points where the next thing is coming? No. Well, the next thing is here. Now you have Live Nation and AEG. And that's about it. They own everything. And I, I, I didn't they, mean and they're that. they're good people. <laughs> but they, are the, they bought everyone else out. Everyone I just mentioned got sold 
to live nation. But, ju but just like the music, whether it's Elvis Presley or it's punk rock or it's hip hop, the, the next thing comes from the margins. It does not come from the center. No, the you, same in business, wouldn't you say? Yeah, a, a little while ago you had Golden Voice. Now Golden Voice championed all the early pump, pump bands and the Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and all that period of bands was Golden Voice. And Golden Voice got bought by Live Nation. Um, so, you really only have two major promoters now in the entire country, Live Nation and AEG, and they're good people, and I play for them. You know, they own nearly all the venues. Um, they literally own nearly all the venues, all the amphitheaters across the country. Um, so the business has changed uh, dramatically. Is it good or is it bad? Gee, I don't know. It's different, I'll say that. On, on a much smaller scale, though, you do see artists putting together tours, using the social media, and doing house concerts at a much smaller level. Yes. Uh, but Again, it does seem like the grassroots possibilities for both management, touring, building a career, however much smaller that career is, they've increased. The, the internet has done that. It's given you a reach that's not just to, to local, but it's national. Now you're in, you know, when we go online, we just did a show with Neil, a live show with Facebook Live called Hometown, which is a concert we did in Canada, and it was around the world. We were able to do it worldwide, and we had over eight million people viewed it online. And so, yeah, you get that uh, those opportunities at the larger level, at the bigger level. Those opportunities aren't afforded young bands and bands that are breaking in. They're just not there yet. So you have to use your own creativity, your own sites, your own Instagram, Facebook. You have to use every tool that's available to you. And you have to expose as much of your music uh, on these, in these points as you can so that people know you exist. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily harder now than it used to be, but it's very different now than it used to be. I think you have to be a lot more creative as an artist now than ever. Um, because there's such competition for that. And music has been, I always go back to this because it still pisses me off so much, how much music has been devalued that it's, now you, you're on your computer and you, know, you play your playlist and, um, and you work on your computer and you're not really focusing it. It's like going to a concert and shooting it with your iPhone, but you never really look at the stage at the live guy who's right there. You're looking at him through your phone. It just seems so stupid to me. <laughs> um, but yet, that's the norm now. That, that's what's happening. So um, you just have to be more on your ball. You have to be more aggressive. Your manager has to coordinate more. You as an artist have to be more creative. It's not just, I wrote this song and I'm playing this song. It can't end there anymore. Now you have to go figure out what are you going to do on social media? How are you going to get people to come to your show? What are you going to do to get them to come to your site on a regular basis? When you come to your site, if it doesn't change after two, three days, after people come to it, they don't go to it anymore. They've seen it. So it has to be active. You have to keep changing that and adding stuff. and walking around downtown with the band and just f filming it and then putting it on your site. Or, you know, you have to do s things that are non-musical that we never thought were connected to your music to bring people to the music. And, and the music that it's bringing is inferior fucking music. It's just, <laughs> it's just, it's just not a good product. You know, we started Neil and I started a company, Neil started a company called Pono, which was high-res audio. It was a high-res audio player, and we sold high-res audio downloads. 
and those downloads were off master recordings. They, were, they sounded exactly like the master, exactly. They were 192.24, the higher resolution you could get. And it sounded amazing. It, it, it got sunk because people weren't interested in high-res audio, and the labels charged three times the price for a download of a quality download. It's 99 cents for an MP3, which sucks, but it was 2.99 for a high-res download. There was no rationale to it because they cost the same to deliver. It's a file. It doesn't cost any more to deliver high res than the MP3. But the record labels, and we never were able to set the price. The labels set the price. And they made us charge $2.99. So it was three times the price of a regular download. So to get the real shit, something that sounded really good, you had to spend $2.99. Or you could spend 99 cents and get 10% of that same master recording. And that was out of fear. Fear the labels had of the streaming services. So they ended up making really, really bad deals with all the streaming services. To this day, those deals are in effect. And what it means is that we all, artists and managers, make a lot less on a consistent basis, and when I say a lot less, again, I'll use that analogy, a million hits is $12. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got to take a second, that blew my mind. <laughs> um, so, it's that much harder to, you know, I'll, I know this is getting lengthy now, I wanted to do a Q&A if anyone wanted to ask anything, but, so, to button it up, it takes a lot more to keep a band together on a manager level. You know, it just takes more hard work. And you have to be aware of it and conscious of it that your band might be in their 20s or 30s or 40s. And they have to make a living. They have families to support. How do you keep that unit together and still, if you're struggling? And, it's tough out there. Sometimes it's the third album, it's the fourth album, it's the fifth album. Um, it, it, if you stick to it and you can stay together and keep making music, if the music's worthwhile, it will get noticed. It just sometimes takes a month, a year, three years, five years. There's no rationale for how long it takes. But if you stay together and you grow as a band, you will happen and you will make it, it's just you don't know when. And it takes a long time, possibly. So how do you stay together? How do you keep this band together? How do you make them so that they can earn a living? And there's ways to do that through publishing and through administration deals. And you just never want to ever give up any of your ownership of your publishing. That's your birthright. That's what you have to live in when you're 50 and 60 and 70. If you've been successful as a band in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, your publishing will allow you to live very well, even if you never play again in your 50s and 60s, because your catalog will throw off enough publishing income that you'll be able to do very well. So, as a manager, protect your artist's publishing at all costs. It's the crown jewel of what he is and what he does, is his publishing. Try to keep in your mind that a band staying together and toughing it out is really, really important. Because if you can just stay the course, you will happen. I'm going to open it to Q and A unless yeah. You let's let, if there are questions out there. Do you have a, a mic? Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I'm if you have take privilege and ask the first question. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank both of you for being here because this is really fantastic. Uh, it's, it's a great thrill and Warren, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Warren, as you'll recall, you, Bill, and I had a, a phone chat a few days ago where we were kind of prepping for this. We talked about something that was really interesting, and I would love it. Uh, ask that question about you know the changing of the music itself and how that may have influenced 
the industry. Oh. But, it, but before you do, if I, I, I have one question I would love sure. to hear the answer to. Um, Elliot, you said earlier when talking about record labels that you didn't want to go to a label. You like being a manager. Well, after the asylum thing. I would just love to know what is it about being a manager that you enjoy as opposed to other aspects of the business? And is there, are there any particular personality traits that are helpful if you're a manager that help you with success and longevity? Okay, that, that goes back to the mountain story. You take a lot of abuse on things that you think are inconsequential compared to the overall thing you think you do. Like, I think I guide careers. I don't worry about backstage passes being fucked up. But they do, and you have to take it the same way. Um, you have to be able to take punishment, because you will fuck up. And when you're fucked up, you will get called on it by your band. And you have to own up to it. You know, again, you, uh, it's like I say, I really do try to work with bands who are, okay, Rick Ocasek was the Cars. Rick is so smart, really brilliant. And there were two guys at Devo, Mark Mothersbaugh and Jerry Casale, two of the smartest people I've ever met and the most creative. So when you're working with those people, you have to not think you know more than they do. Even when I was a big manager and Devo just came to me and they were a new band, it took me an hour and a half to know that Mark and Jerry were smarter than I am and had more of a vision of what they thought Devo was and where it should go. And the concepts for the band were theirs. So you, Rick Okasik and the Cars was the same way. Rick had a vision for what it was. He handed me demos that were the full album. Literally, they were demos he did at home, but they had every part in it. The bass, the drums, the keyboards, and the guitars. They were all there. All the band had to do was go copy the demo. And there are certain artists that you want to try to work with that just get it. They just are, they leave the office and they go home and, and they're writing and they're working and they come in the next day and they go, uh, I want you to hear this. For me as a manager, it's like, what, a th what an honor to work with Dylan and to sit there and have Bob play and talk ideas on what the next tour should be or what we're doing or where we're going. That it gave me great satisfaction to work with Tom and Neil and Joni. And, uh, and I've been very blessed to work with the people that I've worked with, but uh, why wouldn't I want to keep doing that? I mean, to sit with those people on a daily basis, to talk to them on a daily basis as I do, it's, it's like sometimes I can't believe that I do this <laughs> and that I'm uneducated and stupid and still I'm able to do this. That. Um, I have a great deal of respect for artists. I have a great deal of respect for the work that they do and that goes into being an artist because it's not easy. You get a lot of people passing on you. You, you, know, you get a lot of turndowns. Uh, it's hard being an artist. It, it's hard thinking that you're in a competitive environment with other artists. Because so... Uh, for what, me. What, what Scott was uh, alluding to that we were talking about was I was saying that you know sometimes the the music itself can affect the the form that management takes and you know with with Neil and Joni you're coming into the intimacy of the singer songwriter moment and a new model of management comes that you're at this kind of forefront of that is also much more intimate if it's it's not Peter Grant and uh, Led Zeppelin. It's not even, you know, Brian Epstein. It's, it's much closer. 
Uh, do you think that's true, that the music can sometimes affect what form management takes? Oh, without question. You only, again, every artist is individual, and every, there's no formula on, you know, you have to do this and you have to do that. There's just no such thing. And music's ever-changing. Yeah. You know, I, I was lucky enough with Neil that when punk came in or grunge came in, that we were able to embrace those bands and take them on the road with us before they even recorded. Pearl Jam recorded with us for a year before their first album came out. Um, there were just so many bands uh, that um, we were able to embrace as music was changing, because you recognize it. You know when music's changing. You know that rap's the pre predominant music in the world now. It's not a, gonna be a surprise to anybody. And that we've known it for the last five, six years. It's only really come to the fore in the last year where everybody knows it, because that's where all the sales are. If you look at the top 10 selling albums, they're all rap albums. And Justin Timberlake and Taylor Swift. Um, but there's a handful of, of other artists other than rap, and that's what's happening now. Will it, how long will it last? It'll change. You know, there'll be some other music that evolves because music is ever evolving. You know, writers and artists write and live in a different world this year since the Trump election than artists and writers in previous years. You have to take a stand now. I mean, this country's totally fucked. I mean, so, this guy is really fucking up America. Yeah. And there'll be, you will see in the days to come that there will be artists and writers who will be talking about these periods and, um, in a unique way because we're in a, a unique time. You know, punk was, grew out of Reagan and out of, um, this ethic of nya, 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 nya. everything's good, everything's good and punk didn't see it that way for the young kids everything wasn't good uh, and it took time for it to develop and evolve but eventually it did and music reflects the times music always seems to reflect history and we're in a very very unique strange time now so we could be going into one of the greatest musical periods yeah. ever in American life. I swear to God, American I really life. believe it. I really do. I really think so. Should, um, uh, I think that we're on the precipice of something unique and rare. Um, and it always takes a year or two to unfold um, because it's never that direct. Um, but as this country goes through whatever it's going through now, um, the artists, that's who reflects what's happening in our country, as our artists. Whether it's our painters, or our playwrights, or our filmmakers, or our musicians, it's the arts that tells you what your decade was like. And this decade is gonna be really unique um, from anything that's come to the past. So first of all, Warren, I want to thank you for that book. That was a really, really good book. It helped me uh, uh, get into the Petty Catalog. I'd really not gotten into it before, but it really it helped me as an entry point for it. So I appreciate you writing that book. Thank you. Elliot, for this is kind of a, a sideways question, but I, I'd like your perspective on it. I read recently about Paul McCartney negotiating for his publishing rights because from the early 60s to the mid-60s work is coming. I don't know if you have any artists like that, but can you tell us a little bit about what you see that issue of these, these okay. publishings coming back? Uh, there was a period where to sign a contract with a record label, it was called a 360 model. They wanted some of your publishing, some of your merchandise, and some of your live performance money in order to sign you. And the rationale was we're gonna make an investment in you and therefore, we think if that investment bears fruit, we're entitled to pick a little bit of all the fruit. Bad, 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 bad. J 
just really fucked. That kind of, that kind of relationship with your label really led artists to want to leave the label as soon as they were able. Paul, along with Dylan, lost their publishing early. And when the Beatles first signed, EMI took their publishing in order to sign them. Same with John Lennon, they took all the Beatles songs. It's taken years and years for the Beatles to try to get back their catalog. Because again, it lasts forever, your catalog. It earns while you're sleeping. In Sweden, someone's playing your album. That's making money for you, for that writer. And Paul's a smart, smart, smart man. And he knows that for his children, for him to leave the legacy he wants to leave them, he wants to leave them as publishing. That's part of what you want to give your children when you pass, because it continues to work for you. Your publishing's working whether you're sleeping or dead. Your publishing is, is working. Um, so again, that's why I started this by saying part of a manager's job is to make that young kid who has no clue, who, if, a, if he's approached by a record label, will do anything to make that record, to get that deal. You know, there's no price you won't pay. And Neil went through the same thing with the Buffalo Springfield. The first Buffalo Springfield album, Greenstone, took all their publishing. And it took me years to get back those copyrights for Neil, which I finally got back, but it literally took me three years in court. But the um, fact that you retained all of Joni Mitchell's publishing was actually odd for the time. It was totally unique for the yeah. time. And even when we made the deal with Mo, Warners wanted half the publishing. Joni was willing to pass. I said, Joni, we can't give up any publishing to make this deal. She says, if you think that we can't, we can't. You know, But she was willing to not yeah. do the deal if that's what it took. And Neil's the same way. Neil never minds walking away from something if it can't be done the way he wants it done. And you need an artist that's willing to do that. And very few are. You know, to get the opportunity to make a recording when you've done your whole life, when you've tried to make your music and get it out to people, and you finally get a chance, and some record guy says, we want to sign you, you pretty much will do anything uh, to sign that agreement. And that's just... You know, again, you want to have the ability, if you believe in yourself, you want to have the ability, if you believe in your band as a manager, to say, no, I'm sorry, we're going to walk and go someplace else. And McCartney, while he didn't have his publishing, he was also going and uh, buying up a lot of Broadway, for instance. You know, my, my kid was in The Music Man last year, and they paid Paul McCartney to do it. Uh, so he's, you know, he figured it out the hard way. Publishing, I'll, this is the last time I'll say it, it's the crown jewel of what an artist does. It lasts forever. A record won't. The music on it will. Um, but publishing is something that pays you on a business level, it pays you forever. Uh, it's, there's just nothing more important in, in what you do. Are there times you'll give up and lose to get ahead? Yes. There's times that you want to make a deal that you feel this is the right company and the right people, and maybe I, I should give up a little bit of my publishing for this record or for the, you know, the length of this deal, and, and you will. You'll, you'll, you might make that judgment. Some bands won't and some bands will say, fuck it for this opportunity uh, and you know, to be in the big leagues and they're telling me they're gonna do a lot of things for me, I'll do it. You know, I'll, I'll let them take a half my publishing and I'll keep the other half. And remember, publishing is always two halves. There's the publisher half and the writer half. 
every dollar that comes into the publisher gets split between the writer and the publisher. So if you sell your publishing, you still keep your writer's share. So you can sell half your publishing, and that means you're getting three quarters of that dollar. You're getting the half of the publishing you didn't sell and all your writer's share. Do you get that? It's all publishing is split two ways, between the publisher and the writer. And that's real important to know. Ma'am? Hi. Hi. First of all, thank you both for coming. Warren, love the Tom Petty book. Do you have any okay. other books such as that in the works with other musicians? And Elliot, I'd like to ask you as a manager, how involved were you, were you with producers? Mm -hmm. I know that you know different albums, of course, all have a different sound because the producers that they use. And of course, the record labels want units to be sold. And I, I wondered how influential they were in trying to guide the artist into a certain producer thinking that that would increase sales. Sometimes, it's, there's no real answer to that. Sometimes I've picked the producer, like with Bob, I picked Daniel Lenoir, and Bob liked him and did the album. M most artists will s listen to a record they really like and see who produced that record for the sound texture of it and the quality of the vocals, and they'll ask who that producer is, and they'll want to work with them. Um, Sometimes the label will have a producer they've had success with who they like, and they'll suggest. Uh, f for me, I, I'm an artist pick a producer guy. I like the artist to pick the producer he'd like to work with. And there's, there's certain guys, you know, Rick Rubin, who we all want to work with, who regardless of your style, Rick, is a really great producer. He concentrates on your vocal sound and on the texture of the music, and he's really sonically above other people. And so a lot of people want to work with Rick. There are a lot of producers like that. Daniel is one, Lenoir is one. There's, there's really a lot of really good producers out there, but it's very personal, because you're in that studio alone with that art, with your artist, as a, with that producer. And the producer's job is to get the best out of you, which might piss you off sometimes. He might keep saying, no, you're not really there yet. I'm not hearing what I need to hear. I'm not getting what I need to get from you. It's a give and take. Uh, it's not just, here's the song, and I'll play it. Um, so it's very personal who you pick as a player with Tr Tracy Chapman. Um, I'm forgetting his name now, which is horrible, but he produced the Joan Baez album that Tracy really liked. And um, so I put them together. But normally the artist will suggest a record that he really loves the sound of or um, and th I like when the artist picks the producer. And you meet them and you talk and you play them your music and you hear what they think of your music and how they visualize it. And then you make a decision. You don't just call a producer and go, I'd like you to produce me. You go, here's the material. What do you think? What would you like to do with it? How do you see it? And then here's how I see it. And but in situations where the record label has a producer in mind, uh, it's the manager who's in the middle between the artist and the yeah, record Yeah, you either agree or disagree. That. Yeah, you yeah. either go, no, my art is a little hardcore and that's a little soft. Or, but it can also know. be a point of negotiation where the artist might feel inclined to go with that producer because the label wants it. Not any strong artist, not anyone who really believes uh, in their work. Again, that's going all, uh, along with the company man vibe. And that's something I'm again, I infer. Uh, I think it's a bad thing. I, I really don't like the record companies to be involved, to be honest. 
this is counter to what most managers believe. I don't allow A&R on my artists. I don't want them to play their songs for some kid at the company who was at another company last year. Yeah. Now he's at this company <laughs> and he'll be at another company next year to tell my artists whether the material was good or not. I just never saw the value in that. Um, so I like it to be between the producer and the artist. And I like the artist to, again, to sit down with the producer and play the music that they're going to deal with and then hear how the producer would handle it and what he thinks. Does this song need strings? Is, should this be solo? Should we, you know, put a uh, French horn on this or whatever? You want to get feedback from the producer on how he views your music and what he would do with it, what he would do to it. And then you make your decision. But again, I, I, I'm not a record company, pick a guy. They can suggest, and they will, but I think ultimately you want your artist and your producer to go you know, see eye to eye. Uh, thank you both for being here. Um, kind of with the spread of technology and the internet, it's become easier to kind of do things on a more grassroots level and kind of more independently. You kind of see that with the Macklemores, the Chance the Rappers, they're unsigned and kind of going to the top. Do you think that, you know, from the uh, management aspect, it's better to kind of have the label behind you, kind of a big machine behind you, or is it better to kind of dig your heels in and put in the work to do it? independently now that it's easier to have the access? The only problem with independent now and with the big labels is the big labels are worldwide. When you're an independent label, you're here and you have to start making a lot of administration and licensing deals for the music throughout the world. So you really lose the ability. First, Chance the Rapper and Macklemore are probably the only two you could name because there really haven't been very many that have come through the internet only. There's maybe a handful of people, th this hand, that you can say that about. Independent bands have the luxury of being a little wilder, but you have to be more creative. You have to use the internet more you have to do more what Tegan and Sarah did. You have to be more creative on how you reach your fan base. You have to be more patient because the money's, it goes back to my theory of when you sign a band, you expect to make money in the third album. And when you're in the independent world, that's just as true. Um, only you have to be more patient. You have to be more willing to stay the course because it takes a little longer in the independent world to actually get the attention from, and you can't eliminate radio or even the streaming services or even iTunes and Apple um, from how they support music. It's the sound of what they've done to me that gets me so angry, how they've devalued what I held in such high esteem, where music is something you do while you're on the computer is the background. Music used to be, for me, on the forefront at 12 o'clock when, at midnight when I came in or whenever it was. I put on music that was important to me, that made me think or feel or made me feel better or, but music played a real important part in my development and in my life. I, I just don't think that's as true now uh, as it used to be because there's so many other things out there and I don't just mean gaming and other sites and um, it's just, again, the product that the labels and that were all, it's so inferior to what it used to be. And for this age of technology, and I'm assuming that it's gonna change, that three, four years from now, Apple will come out with a 
iPhone that has a great DAC in it that could play high-res music or that could play real quality downloads. It'll happen, it's just not here yet. Be but it will happen. But we sell an inferior product and that's how we start. When you start selling an inferior product, you're at a big disadvantage. And we sell an inferior product. We sell a product that's an MP3 that's a piece of shit. It just is. It's just literally 10% of the music. So it doesn't make you feel. If you play an MP3 really loud, it hurts your ears. When you play vinyl really loud, you want to get a Pepsi and have a hit. You, you want to relax. <laughs> it's... It sounds real good, and it's time for a drink. Uh, so, you know, when you start that we're selling an inferior product to the marketplace, it, it puts us at a disadvantage. It, it will happen again. We will get better at quality sound in the future through technology. I'm, I'm confident of that. I just don't know when it's going to be. Um, so. That part does, you know, you talk about a producer in the studio and then you listen to it on an MP3 and you're not hearing what that guy did. You're hearing 10% of that. If you get a, an album that you like and that you've been listening to on a download on your iPhone and get that album and play it on a vinyl machine, buy a, a piece of vinyl. CDs are a little better than MP3s. Um, and even a CD, play a CD next to a, an MP3, and you'll hear more. You'll go, oh wow, I didn't even know it had the drum part there. And you hear the shh. You, you just hear more air and space. You just feel more, it, literally. And so, you know, you go through getting a producer and spending a lot of money in the studio, and then you listen to it on your computer. Huh? It's just all illogical now. There used to be a chain that made sense. You went in the studio, you recorded it, you made a master, you listened to it on a quality machine. You heard quality music. That's just not where it goes now. How many people in here listen to vinyl more than uh, another form? Uh, most people don't have a vinyl machines. Yeah. I mean, we like to think that there's a ton of people listening to vinyl, but the reality is there isn't. Uh, not percentage-wise, it's such a small percentage of our business. Uh, but the sound quality is five times, ten times better than your iPhone. Um, reel to reel is even better. Who has reel to reel? Raise your hands. No. <laughs> one guy. One good man. Uh, yeah, you, you just won't find that. Again, we don't value music the way we used to subconsciously. It's around us, we hear it, but we don't have the value that music used to have. It just doesn't. Now it's background music. It's something to do while we jog on your iPhone. You know, it's something to do while you're on your computer. You can have your playlist and play it and groove while you're not really paying attention to it. Um, so people don't seem to give a shit as much about the quality of the sound. And, you know, that's, that's a drag, to be honest. It just is. Do you think people care as much about the quality of the song, though? Do you think yes. that? Yes. Yeah, songs are songs. Music is still good for the soul. There's no doubt about that. But, but, but I'm talking about the audience in this devaluing. Because um, I feel like when I teach my, my students, I feel like... Uh, Yes, their experience of music has changed dramatically from what I grew up with, but the way they value the song is there's a thing of continuity there. I agree with that. I, again, the song still is important in your life. There's still certain times of your life when you want to hear something that brings you up when you're down or that's reflective that you're going through, you broke up with someone, there's still going to be always be songs. Songs are songs. Songs are precious. They're jewels. They're great. Songs are the real deal. Th that's what all of music is about, is, is quality songs. It's just that it's not 
after the quality song. It's not given to the consumer in a quality way anymore. But, but from the artist's perspective, I th I, to me, this is the most optimistic thing about music is that, that for all the changes, it's still good for the, the good soul. good song is still king. Without question. A good song will, will surface. A good song will last for years and years and years. Publishing. <laughs> if you guys don't feel guilty when you go home and listen to MP3s. No, I, you know, music's music. There's nothing better. I, you know, I love music. You know, uh, there's nothing I'd rather do than sit back and listen to really great music that I love. And I, you know, I have a lot of my own personal favorites. And we were just talking about Dana and I. And when we're at home, we listen to Garth Brooks. I'm so embarrassed to say that loud. But, <laughs> Um, we like discovered Garth two years ago. Maybe we were a little late, but um, and we listened to it on Sirius XM. We have the Garth channel, and Sirius XM is not as good as an MP3. It isn't. It's a level under an MP3. Yet we listen to Garth, and we love his music. We love his songs. You, we get it. Then I went and I bought albums so I could hear it on vinyl. And it was a world better. You got to hear all the nuances of his vocals. And he's such a great vocal stylist. Can we do one, one last question? We've got one last question here. No, they don't. You're 100% right. They've never heard it. They've, they've had, uh, you know, it's been Apple all their lives. They've had iPhones all their lives. Convenience opted over quality. You know, the, the idea that you could have a thousand albums in your pocket, even if they sounded shitty, was still a marvel when it first came out. And it was a marvel. But the idea that, like, I have four boys. I have four kids, and they range from now they're mid-twenties to their forties. And they're, uh, they're Apple kids. You know, they listen to vinyl at home, but they were raised on an iPhone and on iTunes. And they don't know any difference. And I, you know, my kids know, but their friends, when they come over and I try to convince them, listen to it on an album, they don't get it. They go, you know, well, why? You know, this is great. <laughs> they just don't know the difference because, as you said, it's true. They've never heard it. And we try to educate that through this Pono, uh, which we did for like four years, and we lost a couple million dollars on it. I don't mind telling you. Um, because we really, and actually right now, you can go to a thing called the Neil Young Archives dot com. And it's high-res audio. It's free. Every song Neil's ever recorded is on that site, right? You can listen to anything he's ever recorded free in high-res audio. Now, we pay for that because we had to pay the label, even though it's us. And it's our label. So we've had to pay whatever fees were needed to pay to make that a reality and it's free so you can go and hear high res audio of neil's work if you just on your phone uh, not on your phone on your computer soon it will be on your phone we're doing a mobile app right now that you know again neil's underwriting he's giving away all his music for free in high res so you can hear it the way he recorded it, the way he wanted it to be heard. That's, that's his whole trip. That's the, and it, it, it was our extension from Pono, where we try to sell high-res downloads, but in, now in, instead of selling them, we're giving them away for free so you can experience high-res. You can experience how the master sounded. Not an MP3 or even a CD. It's a step above those. 
that's how committed he is as an individual to sound. That he'll give all his songs away for free. All you got to do is go to the site, Neil Young Archives. And it's also all his archives. It's videos and movies and all sorts of shit. And it's all free. And he underwrites it all. Luckily, he can afford to do that. But the fact that he's willing to do that tells me this guy has an uncanny commitment to sound. That he's willing to give away every song he's ever written is on this site. Ever recorded, I should say, for free. You could hear it. You could stream it. It's a streaming service. It's a high-res audio streaming service. Neil's the only artist on it because we couldn't get licenses from the other, lab other labels because it's free. They don't make any money. We don't make any money. But what we do do is give you a chance to hear high-res audio, audio that's copied from the original master. And we did that. We, Neil went in the studio and through all of our masters, there's like 50 albums, we digitized them to 192.24, which is the highest res you can go, for you guys, for people to listen to. So that because Pono wasn't, was a failure for us, the concept was never a failure. The business was a failure. For a lot of reasons, the labels charged too much. We didn't have enough money to back us. But the concept wasn't a failure. There's nothing wrong with better music. There's nothing wrong with giving the consumer the real deal. There's nothing wrong with that. So that's what we're doing now after Pono because Neil won't quit. He doesn't think that because Pono didn't work, you shouldn't get high-res audio, that you shouldn't be able to hear his material. What, and Neil's real serious about his material. The best way humanly possible. And that's what he's done. And he spends hundreds of thousands of dollars to make this happen for no reason other than he wants people to ex be exposed to the real deal. Because m music has been so much a part of our lives and so important to us, to see it devalued is not acceptable. It's not that it's heartbreaking, because we don't just feel bad. We wanna, you want to do something about it positively. And what he's done is put his money where his mouth is and that you can go to the neilyoungarchives.com and uh, bless your heart. It sounds great. Great, thank you. Uh, Elliot, I want, I want to thank you. I want to thank all of you for coming down. Um, but Elliot, it's been a, a total treat. And uh, we, oh, stop. we barely touched <laughs> oh, on, on Devo. We barely touched on the cars. There's much more we could have done. But thank you for, for being here tonight. <laughs> and thanks to all of you. Thank you.